Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this, our second event to celebrate and talk more about Hay Festival's uh, Europa 28 project, which is in partnership with WOMARTS. And I must say that this event is funded by Creative Europe. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, our three participants today they all took part and are and are part of the Europa 28 project um, and they've all contributed to the uh, accompanying anthology but I'll be talking a little bit about that afterwards um, ordinarily at Hay Festival behind me you would see a screen uh, that says something like Hay Festival and I think it says, imagine the world. Well, today we're gonna to look a little bit closer to home and imagine uh, imagine Europe, or indeed reimagine Europe. Uh, I'm gonna start by introducing Moroccan-born, Paris-based Leila Slimani, who won the Prix Goncourt for her best-selling novel, Lullaby, and is also the author of Adele, and most recently, this year, um, a book of non-fiction, which is called Sex and Lies, on the subject of sexual rights and sexuality within Arab cultures. And that brings together conversations um, and accounts that uh, Leila took from uh, women that she interviewed on her a recent book tour in Morocco. Lisa Duan is an Irish actor and the foremost interpreter of Samuel Beckett. For me, and I'm sure for so many people, Duan is the living voice of Beckett's collective consciousness. So it's absolutely wonderful that we can have you here, Lisa, to discuss um, Europe's collective consciousness or not, as the case may be. Um, and Lisa has recently collaborated on theatrical work um, with Colin Toybin and with Margaret Atwood, who we've all just seen on screen as well. Welcome, Lisa, and thank you. Um, and last but not least, we have Hilary Cottam, who is not feeling so well today, but she's an absolute powerhouse, uh, an intellectually acclaimed social activist whose work in Britain, but also around the world and in Europe, has focused on collaborative and also affordable solutions to some of the world's greatest challenges. Her book, which was recommended by Jonathan Friedland of The Guardian as the book to read uh, last year, is called Radical Help, How We Can Remake the Relationships Between Us and Revolutionise the Welfare State. And it's been applauded and also put into practice in, in many ways, um, not just in Britain, but across Europe and the globe. So we have a real treat in store for you today. But before we um, begin the discussion, I have one more housekeeping point to make, which is that unfortunately, Leila is not able to stay with us for the full 45 minutes. We are very happy to have her for 30 minutes, but childcare um, comes first and there was a slip up with timing. So um, we've got Leila for the first, uh, half more or less of the event so if it feels a little bit Layla heavy which is great but uh, you know I'm not ignoring everyone else we're just going to try and get a few more questions to Layla before she has to leave us. Um, last but, but not least I said that was you Hilary but really we're also here to introduce this anthology uh, which is part of a wider project so this is Europa 28 writing by women on the future of Europe uh, it's co-edited by me and uh, Sarah Cleave I'm Sophie Hughes um, it's published by Comma Press and as I said it's a Hay Festival project at the heart of the project is actually a festival a real festival not this festival uh, it's a festival that is taking place it's a, a, a mini hay festival is taking place uh, in Rijeka it's meant to be taking place in a few weeks time but of course it's not we're hoping that it will take place in in October so do take a look have a look online have a look on the hay website and see um, whether or not uh, you are able to come and join the conversations that will be going on there this book is a um, is a book is a, is a physical format of some of those conversations kind of snapshots or crystallizations of some of the conversations that have been had and that we will be having um alif shafak the writer says that europa 28 dares to tell the stories of europe beyond its centers of power and privilege and i think daring really is the key word here um because of, of a world in a world where we live of fast fast thinking and fast opinion, it, this anthology really offers slow deliberation and honesty, which is palpable uh, in, on every page. It's very open-hearted, 
generous intellect, scholarship and journalist, journalism, but also because it includes fiction, uh, it's generous in the sense of uh, what, what it offers in terms of imaginative empathy as well. Uh, we asked all of the participants to imagine what an ideal Europe might look like. The, the brief was very broad. They could take it wherever they wanted to. And they really, really did. As you'll see today, we've got three very different thinkers um, with us. Um, really what we wanted to do was not add more opinion to the argument uh, because it seems that we've just become inured to it. So this is about collaboration, conversation, and it's made possible as well, I have to add, because I'm a translator too, by world-class translators, because of course we've got uh, participants from one country, uh, from, from each participant from one country uh, member of the EU. So channeled into this anthology is not just slow deliberation, but propulsive and bright imagination. And I want to start today uh, by thinking uh, a little bit uh, more currently. So I'm going to ask all of our participants whether now uh, that the book has been published in this new context, in the context of a global pandemic, whether or not it has made you think slightly differently about Europe and about what Europe's future could look like, whether or not you're feeling more positive because of shows of solidarity or more desperate or um, negative because of uh, the way that perhaps, for example, some governments may have manipulated some of these, uh, some of the uh, tragedies that are going on around us and, and, and manipulated them to their advantage. Big questions. I'm going to start with you, Leila. Um, honestly, I must say that um, I'm quite negative. I think that this crisis confirmed a lot of things that I was thinking about Europe, the lack of solidarity, the lack of leadership, the fact that when there is a problem, each country is going to retract on, on itself. The fact also that we invest so um, not, not enough in our public health system and in public services in, in general. And also the, the rise of xenophobia. You can see today in Italy, in France, in Spain, uh, everywhere people are pointing the, the, the migrants or pointing people from abroad saying this is because of them that we are facing that, especially people from Asia, but also migrants in the, in the camps in the north of, of France. So for me, it's just a confirmation of what I was thinking before, um, a continent where it's, there is less and less solidarity and where we are so much afraid of people coming from abroad. Okay, thank you. And um, Hilary, if I can come to you next, how are you? How are you feeling about the future of Europe uh, in the, in our current situation? Well, I think that probably the biggest thing is that you know I wouldn't be in this beautiful book had it been. I mean, if you're asking about the difference in circumstances, the final chapter is a writer from the United Kingdom, and of course, if we do this project again, sadly that chapter will be missing because we won't be part of Europe. Um, I think the pandemic. I mean, it's a huge moment of rupture, and what we can see is that orthodoxies have been turned on their head. Economic orthodoxies have been abandoned overnight. We have seen a huge groundswell of participation, of solidarity. The things that Leila talks about are happening alongside people beginning to care for each other, talking to their neighbours in new ways. And I suppose the question is that the European project itself grew out of a sort of wave of social and economic transformation after the Second World War. And can we use this moment of rupture now to kind of rethink and reimagine in the ways that are put forward in the collection and the ways that we're talking about? Um, it's there to fight for, I think, but it, it will be it will be a struggle to kind of reimagine in the ways that we need to reimagine. And I suppose just the final thing is that one of the things that is very obvious in this moment is that it's all about trust, and the local state does better at trust than the national state. I mean, particularly in this country, where of course we've now lost trust completely in the national state. So, so the question is then, how could we reimagine a kind of pan-national project, bearing those issues, those relationships, and those challenges of trust in mind, I think. Thank you. We're going to, I think, come back to trust and honesty um, uh, in the next 40 minutes. Um, Lisa, how are you feeling? 
ladies have spoken before. I mean, if COVID has taught us anything, it's how we're all inextricably linked. Um, and in that vacuum of leadership that everyone is speaking about, and it's across the board, although I, I, we couldn't have an event like this without saying it has been proven that female leaders have fared better in this regard. We might think about that when we're reimagining our future and idea of Europe and remember just how let down we have been. But ultimately, I feel slightly hopeful because one of the things that has reminded us is of our own responsibility the success with social distancing is down to our responsibility to our civic duty and to ourselves and um, to initiate something as counterintuitive as social distancing um, you know like any species we uh, contract when we're frightened and I think that's one of the things we've all shared is a collective fear. And this isn't simply a physical reflex. We also contract our ideas of ourselves in that rigid fear. And it's in that moment that things like nationalism and uh, far right populism emerge. And that concerns me. And it concerns me that we live in times when new boundary lines are being drawn and when the news is being filled with the same old conversations about nationalism and populism and, and fear mongering. And we must remember that they're just a set of narratives. And if Becca taught me anything that um, we can live outside of narratives that we tell ourselves and we must. And Europe for me always expanded the idea of the narratives that perhaps I was given about my own identity and where I belong. And I think it's unfortunate that Britain has chosen to um, contract at this moment and, and leave the party. Um, as, as debauched and broken as it is, I think it's down to our individual responsibilities more than anything else. And I really think, um, you know, what Hillary was saying is right. This is a time for ideas, for sharing. And I take huge solace in how quickly we've managed to create these online communities, how quickly Hay was able to reform. And maybe together we can look at different narratives narratives um, and overpress the more oppressive voices that never took us anywhere. Um, it, it's interesting that you talk about that, you know, the individual having to, to work on this solidarity that feeds into a lot of your work, Hillary, as well. Um, and Lisa, I was saying in the event that was just taking place earlier today, that in fact, so many, um, especially perhaps young Britons for whom this, for whom Brexit will define their idea um, that you know this this generation it will be a defining moment of trauma really, um, but for them the break from Europe will actually make their sense of being European more replete. It will it actually has had the kind of counter effect um, for 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 some. It's just that of course we will no longer be part part of the union. Um, I'm gonna move on to ask um to ask you Leila a, a particular question thinking about your piece it, um in your piece for Europa 28 you hone in on the Mediterranean um on the sea and what you you remind us Homer called the liquid road but that actually we are not as Europeans treating very much like a liquid road in our in our thinking and part of what you talk about is is our inability to define ourselves with and including the global south, that which is beyond the Mediterranean. Um, this obviously becomes very um, topical and painful uh, if, you, if you make the, the very short inductive leap to, to the refugee crisis and to those people who are literally crossing the Mediterranean for better lives. And it struck me to think that last year, for the first time since 2015, the asylum applications in Europe rose again. The crisis has, you know, the, the refugee crisis hasn't gone a, uh, anywhere. But I wondered if you think there have been new developments in a kind of, um, you know, almost supranational identity crisis in Europe uh, in response to the refugee crisis and our failures. You know, when I began to write this this piece, I remembered my childhood. I was born and raised in, in Morocco. And uh, in the 80s, I remember that my father said to me, he was Moroccan and I'm Moroccan too, he said to me, you know, maybe one day Morocco will be a part of Europe. And there was this idea, it was the idea of the king of Morocco to build a bridge between Morocco and Spain. 
can you really imagine today someone saying we're going to build a bridge between Morocco and Spain? Can you imagine today that Turkey could be a real candidate for European Union? So for me, it's very sad because this is all the dreams of my childhood that I know that will never be accomplished in, uh, during my lifetime. And um, no, I think it's worse and worse if you look at Andalusia today. Uh, today, the, there is a rise of 2,000% of people coming in Andalusia and the south of, of Spain, and 60% of them are less than 15 years old. They are children, just little children. You have also a rise of people who are buried in uh, Lampedusa, in Lesbos, in Spain without names. We don't know who they are. We don't know where they come from. They are just bodies. They arrive on the, our borders and we put them in graves without name. Could you imagine that we put people, white people in graves without name, without even searching who they are? So for me, that's a real betrayal of what Europe is, you know, as a Moroccan, as a little girl, a Moroccan little girl, for me, Europe was the lighthouse of the world. It was not a question of ethnicity. It was not a question of geography. It was a question of values. It was a place where I could be a free woman. It was a place where I could have free speech, where I could fight for so many things. And I have the feeling that it betrayed me, it betrayed my the dream I had when I was a when I was a child because it's not that anymore for so many people and all the people in the south who look at Europe and look up at Europe and expect so much from from this European Union they are betrayed when they are just you know we have slavery in the border of Union slavery in Libya slavery in Algeria in Morocco just in front of our continent so for me it's really really the the biggest tragedy of of our continent today and it's not just a tragedy is it you know it's it's an outrage um how you know you i can you can hear in your voice and if you read anything that leila writes any of your non-fiction there's a rage there um and i think a lot of it a lot of us feel it um but also a, there's a lot of apathy so you marked out the difference between how people see europeanness from the outside looking in. Are we just too apathetic? Have, have, the, have we just become apathetic because the ideals came good? Because in a way we took advantage and we just, we just got used to the freedoms that we enjoy. How can we engage people once more to live up to those ideals? And ignore the divide, you know, there, because there are divisive discourses that are precisely harnessing uh, harnessing that up. You know, I think that maybe it's a question also of pride. I am proud to be to be French and to be here, and I am proud of these values I'm living with: free uh, freedom of speech, uh, the right to for abortion, and all that. We should be proud of having this, and we should want to share it. But in a certain way, we have this complex, and I speak more for French people. French people, they have this complex that you can't be proud of this kind of values because it would be a sort of neo-colonial think so you shouldn't say to other people and especially in Maghreb that you are proud of uh, secularism or right of abortion because there is this idea of cultural relativism you know everyone should do as he wants but no there are I believe in universality and what is the core of Europe the idea that some values can be universal it's not a question of the color of your skin of your religion or the fact that you are white or black or woman or man some values are universal they, they go for everyone and we should be brave enough to fight for that you know I think that People say to me, oh, you know, veil or uh, rape, it's cultural. No, it's not cultural. Crime is not a culture. Rape is not a culture. This is not a culture and it will never be. And so we should fight for what we believe in and we should be proud of fighting for that and not feeling ashamed because people are looking at us telling us that we are neo-colonial, I don't know what. No, I am proud of that and I believe in universalism of, of values. Um, 
Leila, moving like leading on, leading on from those ideas, um, your latest book, Sex and Lies. In there, you look specifically at the sexual rights of women in Arab cultures and in Morocco in particular. And you say in the book that, that, that for you, that um, the sexual rights are human rights, the, the, the two are inextricable. Um, do you think that, uh, kind of as a French Moroccan, do you think that apathy around human rights leaves us more exposed to them being eroded now? Do you, I mean, Yeah, I think I, I think my question is really how you see the kind of groundswell, how you see people um, acting, the individual acting now, um, how how change can come about. Um, kind of no, in the beginning of the, the first sentence of my of my piece is about the fact that maybe the future of freedom is going to be written in the south and not not in the north. We always have this idea that Europe or the Western world is the incarnation of freedom of those values. But if you look at what happened in Tunisia, in Algeria, in Egypt, millions of people going in the streets and facing violence and facing death for the idea of, of freedom and sometimes of mixity and of democracy. So what is sad is that today they're not going to turn themselves to Europe and to ask for uh, solidarity because they don't believe uh, uh, in that anymore. But I am optimistic because I think that youngsters, people in, in Africa, in, in Morocco, in Tunisia, as I said, they want to be free. And, you know, women now, they study more and more, they work more and more, and they're, they are very successful and they travel and they watch a lot of movies and they watch Netflix and they, they can see now what it is to be a woman all over the world and they want to be free. And I am pretty sure they are going to fight for that. But um, I would love people to be to to be more so there is more solidarity between people and not always this contradiction between Europe and the South. You know, when I go to Morocco and when I defend feminism and abortion and the right for homosexual to have relationship, etc., people say to me, "Oh, yeah, but you know, you're from you're from France, so now you're like you're a white." you're a white woman, you're not like us anymore, you're, you're a traitor. And I think it's very sad to be seen like that. I'm not a traitor, I just believe that those values can also be values for Moroccan people. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, um, Leila, I don't know whether you have any more time to stay with us. I, I'm aware that you... Children. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I lost you for a little bit there, but I did ca catch the key word, which was your children. <laughs> uh, so yeah. I think um, I think that we will say goodbye to Layla. Thank you so much. Thank, and you, I, thank um, you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Layla, and we'll carry on the conversation now. Um, I want to move on to, to talk to you, Hilary, um, a little bit about your work in general. Um, and and your your contribution to the anthology as well. So um, my question for you, my first and immediate question, um, given your social work is, um, despite these high European uh, uh, ideals that, that we've been talking about, and the EU, which still seems to stand for these egalitarian values um, and inclusiveness and law and freedom, um, so many people, and this is really what the anthology is about, so many people still seem to feel disenfranchised, despite the idea that these ideals are, are still alive and well. Um, they feel disenfranchised from Europe and they feel disenfranchised in this country from the European Union. Um, your work is about, is about listening and connecting people. Um, what have you heard and what have you listened to, not just in Britain, but around Europe that can give us, give, you know, give you insight and that you can share with us about why it is that people feel so um, disconnected to, to Europe and their identity? Yes, I think it's, I mean, everything you say is true. You know, Europe stands for these very lofty ideals. I'm very proud to be a European. 
But I think the problem comes when the gap between the sort of pronounced ideals and a lived reality, personal or in a community, just becomes too wide. And I think that that's happened at two levels. One, it's happened at a level of ideas that we've got these... I mean, Europe is this sort of idea of technocratic progress, which I think for many, many people, not just those who, who have voted or want to leave the European Union, no longer sort of fits. I mean, partly there's the techno bit that doesn't any longer fit because we've got a very different sort of form of technology, which is changing our communities, our families, how we work. It's created kind of huge new divisions between us. The idea of progress in that sort of very rational, technocratic way doesn't seem to work either. I mean, we're kind of headlong, you know, rushing into an ecological crisis that that old form of progress no longer seems to fit. And then thirdly, which is the bit that is most important in my work, is this, well, this challenge of just pervasive inequality and new forms of poverty that have arisen. So the places that I work in, the communities I work in in this country, but also in Europe and Scandinavia, for example, um, the stories, they seem mythical, the kind of national stories that are told of, of progress and meritocracy and so on. And, you know, I'm working in communities where perhaps, well, nationally, this is the story that over a third of British families are in work, perhaps two parents working, and still the impossibility of kind of living on the salary that you're earning. So, you know, I describe in my contribution to the anthology, my um, I borrow from, uh, from Tausig, the anthropologist, and I say that my work is like a pilgrimage and I'm there to listen. And I'm listening not just to what's said, but I'm listening to bumps in the stories, to the silences, the things that aren't said. Um, and I think that there's just this huge hunger still to belong, to have a story that kind of, that is felt in the heart, that isn't this distant story about progress, which really doesn't mean anything to me in my life and my community. Um, and and the, my piece is about witchcraft because it's about two witches in particular, actually one called Margaret and one called Maria, um, because I'm very interested in what happens in societies at that point where the kind of official story leaves reality to a point that for most people it no longer feels true and it does become that stretched and then you get the growth of of all sorts of things i mean we've talked already about populism and so on you get the growth of sort of mythical stories brexit is a mythical story on both sides because you have um the idea in the communities that i work in they're all brexit places that europe isn't working and then you have the other ideas of the sort of metropolitan elites which is like those people are crazy like do they not know in Cornwall that you know they're they're living off a European grant so on both sides it's sort of kind of a magical reality that has taken over and so um in my piece in my real work of course I'm looking at what can we actually build that is that is connecting us again to one another and kind of changes those inequalities at its heart but in the anthology I'm exploring how can we kind of reweave those stories? What's in that magic? How can we kind of pull things out and begin to reweave again? Because ultimately we have to kind of know each other in new ways, connect together in new ways to thrive, to flourish, but also for any kind of political project, whether it's national or hopefully European to, mm. to survive and grow. I think that's why I brought up the pandemic actually, because um, it feels that it could potentially be a crossroads, couldn't it? It feels like a moment of, of potential uh, to implement change. Uh, lots of people, for example, are talking about universal, um, basic universal income, to, to, to pluck an example, uh, out of nowhere really. But um, I suppose um, deep participation is something that you talk about a lot uh, in your book. It's a beautiful phrase, this idea of deep participation. And can you tell me what deep participation looks like? Um, Yeah, but really what deep participation looks like when we're talking about renovating the welfare system and making well, lives better. Well, I suppose the first thing to say is that um, the idea of Europe, the idea of the welfare state, which, as you said, is what I work on, um, welfare states, I should say, sort of more broadly than just the British welfare state. You know, when those ideas were conceived at the end of the Second World War in bombed out cities and we'd had this sort of terrible, you know, 
war within Europe. Um, you could have said that this was magical thinking for leaders to stand up and say, we're going to provide decent housing, we're going to provide education, healthcare. Um, you know, this this could have just been dismissed as magical. But but somehow those stories cut through. I mean, I, I, I write about how in Radical Help. Um, and people sort of came together around a new image and a new story in which they felt that they had a role, that, you know, people were telling the stories. It wasn't just some story that was handed down on, from on high. And I suppose that one of the things that the sort of flip side of what I'm talking about in terms of deep participation is that those same communities that I'm talking about that may, for example, have voted for Brexit are the places in this country where I'm seeing really sort of deep participation, where new social models are growing, where new forms of taking care of each other, let's say Barrow, Kilmarnock, Plymouth. I mean, I, you know, in these places, very new forms of social settlement are growing kind of organically that provide the seeds and the experiments of how we could begin to kind of redesign um, definitely within this country and, and in other countries in Europe as well. So I think that the, the seeds are there. I mean, one thing that I think is really interesting from my work is that when um, previously when I was going around and saying to people you know I, we've developed these models and they're based on, on on participation people would look at the business cases and they would say oh, well we believe that this would be great because it would save us money because people would be part that's never the point of the work this is not kind of the British big society but people believe that this would be a better way to go but then they said oh you know but in this place here people will never participate so what we have definitely seen in this pandemic is that people will participate that you know um, People have joined, um, as Lisa was saying, kind of apps have risen up. People are taking care of one of each other. Each other. I don't think it's realistic to think that all those sort of forms of social infrastructure that have grown overnight will last. But we're not going to forget now that experience of knowing our neighbour, of taking care of one another. And we can definitely build on that in the same way that Europe was created out of the trenches and an understanding that, gosh, you know what, people are poor because they're lazy, they're poor because the systems are stacked against them and that we have to redesign those systems, that this is a systemic issue. Do you think that there is a risk, though, that we will stop listening to our European neighbours at a very local level? We're listening more, we're interacting more. But obviously, the break with the European Union, my next question to you was going to be whether you see an ideal or a near ideal welfare state somewhere in Europe, that now, in a way, we've sort of cut ourselves off to the option of the possibility of learning from Europe. Well, I think it's really important to be learning all the time, but I would say, you know, that that ideal state is in Kilmarnock or in Barrow, actually. It's not, mm -hmm. uh, it's probably not in Europe. And I mean, radical health has been translated into Danish, for example. And in the beginning, I was very surprised. I said to, you know, the Danish municipalities I was working with, why, you know, we look to you as a solution. Why on earth have you translated the book and why do you want to work with me? And the answer is because the models that we're working with, and this brings us back to the idea of Europe and the anthology, is that the sort of mental frameworks that we have are those inherited from the post-war period. And they are not helping us connect one, each, and one another. They're not helping us grapple with the really big challenges that we face today which are very different to the kinds of social challenges that we faced when those systems were designed so the ideal doesn't exist anywhere and in fact one of the things that we could be proud of actually is the kind of level of innovation we have at the community level i mean it's it's a sort of bitter thing because of course if we compare ourselves with scandinavia the kind of level of professionalism and the well-funded i mean it's a dream in a way um, but also that that that's a sort of double-edged thing. It's brilliant. We definitely want that. And part of the story of radical help is how to kind of, you know, uh, take care of our professionals in a new way, which is so important if we want to make change. But the other side of the story is giving communities and people power to actually tell their own stories and begin to kind of reweave things. That